participant will get the modified. Thank you. Um, if that happens, participant will get the modified version at the end of the training. And like we always say, uh, don't be too formal, don't be formal. Um, um, cooperate actively, your feedback is highly welcome. Um, we have always maintained that uh, nobody knows it all, in as much as we are facilitating this training. Um, your insight and your experience can also add um, to the learning of every other person, including we as well, the facilitators. So please uh, feel free to make your contributions. From the beginning of the training, um, I introduced the concept of energy sustainability. And I said, energy sustainability has two major components. And that has to do with energy efficiency. That's um, energy efficiency. That's identification of the losses and the wastages in the system and dealing with them like you need to push them out. Then the other component of it is meeting the required energy from renewable energy source, like the source that does not cause environmental um, damages or does not cause um, harm to the environment and it's inexhaustible. In the first section of this training, we dealt with the energy efficiency. We looked at the energy basic, we looked at the energy efficiency in industries, commercial businesses, and even at homes, and how we can identify these losses and how we can deal with them. And we're going to be proceeding with the, uh, um, with the renewable energy in this training. Um, I think I need to skip all of this. Uh, okay. So um, now to the main business, solar PV applications and design. I'm sure most of us are not, solar PV is not new to any of us. It's something that we see um, along the road. We see on if not if not that many of us already have them in our homes, um, but it's not something that is abstract. It's something that is almost everywhere. Not everywhere though, but in so many places that when you move around, you definitely would have seen solar panels. So let's um, we will talk about solar panels. Uh, I think the right word should be um, PV models. And we're going to look at the cells. We're going to look at the different um, arrangement of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the cells into models. But first of all, PV photovoltaic, that's the PV, what we call PV is photovoltaic, is the technology that generates electricity. Sorry, sir, your, your screen is not changing. Can we see solar panels? Yeah. See what we are still seeing is that roof, that roof that you oh, started really? with. That is what, yes, nothing is changing at all. Oh, wow. Wow. Sorry, I, I didn't know. Thank you for calling my attention to that. I didn't know. Let me stop yeah. this. Yeah, it's in the, in the comment section. It's not, people have, one of the people has mentioned it. That's, it's not changing. Thank you. Thank you for that. I... Just a moment, I'm trying to fix this. I think I was sharing the the document that's uh, the wrong document, not the PowerPoint. Um, so I'm trying to fix that now. Okay, so, fine. So we are seeing a new uh, 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 right up on the screen. Now, introduction. Okay, you have, you have removed it again. Okay, okay. Now it's solar PV applications and design, correct? You have just come back to the roof again. Maybe you go yes, back to yes, what you were sharing yes, just yes, now. Yes, yes, yes. Now, is it moving? Yes, yes, yes. I can see Chima Munweke. Thank you so much. So, sorry, Um, I think I, I shared a PV version. I'm sorry, I shared a PDF version, and I was I was I already explaining from the PowerPoint. So that was the mix-up. Sorry about that. Uh, no, the PowerPoint, uh, the real screen is up. 
Yeah, so this was the introduction about me that I talked about. Um, sorry for the, uh, the lost time as well. Um, and I already spoke about the training. I was really, I was talking about this, not knowing that the screen was not also changing. And I, I already discussed about this, you know, in our first session. And uh, I'm just going to skip this whole energy conservation and jump into solar PV application and design. Okay. So this this was where I was I was this was where I, this is where I was before my attention was called that the screen was not projecting. Sorry about that. So um, PV or photovoltaic, like we all know, is a technology that generates electricity directly from the sun via a photo photoelectric effect. The photovoltaic model made up of photovoltaic cells transform solar energy into DC electricity. I think this is very important. PV models generate DC electricity, not AC electricity. So the PV generated electricity can be fed into the grid, stored in battery or uh, stored in battery for later use or use directly. Now, um, when we go to the markets to look at um, PV models, um, so many terminologies have been introduced into the market. So many concepts have been introduced into the market and sometimes uh, we, we might even get confused. So I think it's also important that we begin to clarify some of these terminologies and concepts that you might meet in the market. So you see N-type, you see P-type, you see uh, um, bifacial, you see um, top corn, you, I mean, so many terminologies, you see P -E -R -C, you see um, half, okay, I've mentioned half cut, but some of them are going to talk about them. Yeah, you see monocrystalline, polycrystalline, thing, thing, so many, Terminology, terminologies, so many uh, uh, um, um, terms. So let, let, let me start by just you know um, trying to explain uh, the basics of solar, solar cells. Okay. So if you look at what's how this the, 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 the image you're looking at is just uh, is it, like a cut through into a solar PV models to expose the solar cells and how electricity is actually being generated. Okay. So if you look at this circle here, you see that um, there's there's a, there's a, a there's a, a thing, there's a layer here. The yellow um, the yellow line you see is called the P PN junction, and then on top of it you find the the uh, the photons, and um, below it, sorry, on top of it you find the electrons, and below it uh, you find the now the, 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 the electrons are the negative, negatively charged uh, um, part of this um, element. And then below it, you find the positively charged um, element. So now, this, the, the yellow line between them is called the PN junction. That is positive and negative. Of course, you, you know, when you connect a wire between the two of them, the, the electron flows. I mean, you generate electricity. Now the reason why I try I try to explain this is now to explain what the P type and the and and the N type uh, model actually means. Okay, so uh, now it, the difference between N type and P type is just based on the on the base material that is used in producing this cell. That's what makes the difference. You now when you say that this is, and and essentially when you go out in the market you may mostly see N type because N type is more efficient. It has lower degradation ratio. We're going to talk about degradations, uh, but just if you don't clearly understand what I mean, just, just hold it. We're going to talk about it in the course of this training, but it has lower this degradation. What that means is that it can last longer. It can have uh, a lifespan of over 30 years or even more um, compared to peak type. You know, we usually say that solar panels have a lifespan of 20 or 25 years, but with this new technology, the end type, we are beginning to see solar panel can even last up to 30 years. So that's what the N-type is. So it has a lower degradation ratio. So it can last a longer time than the P-type. And what actually also makes the difference is that, okay, um, the N-type is, okay, the P-type is doped. Now, it depends on the base material, like I said. So for the P-type, it is doped in, in boron, whereas the N-type is doped in phosphorus. Now, this is more, more like being technical. We are not manufacturing solar cells here, but I think it's just important that we know some more. Some of these terminologies, you know, so that we will go out, we don't get confused as um, as energy professionals. So the end type has a higher efficiency. It has a higher efficiency. Uh, it has a lower degradation, so it can last longer, even though it's slightly more expensive. Okay, but it has a higher efficiency. It can last longer. So um, I also want to introduce the fact that. Um, 
Another solar energy technology is the solar thermal. So we have two types of energy that can be generated from the sun. We have the solar, uh, photo, photo, um, solar photovoltaic, I'll have the solar thermal. So we're just good at we differentiate between these two as well. So solar thermal uses solar energy to generate heat rather than electricity. So it is important to distinguish between the two very different technology, which often confuse since they use the same energy source, which is the solar radiation. And this is how the solar um, solar thermal works. Um, cold water enters through the, um, the the heating panels, and as it moves through these um, tubes, it gets heated by the sun, and it comes out here as hot water. So this is the basic display or the basic diagram of solar thermal. So let us look at different configurations of um, solar systems. We have different configuration. We have off grid. We have grid connected PV systems. Off grid. So in Nigeria, I, okay, I think we now have grid connected PV system in Kano. We have one 10 megawatt um, embedded. Embedded means that it is embedded to the grid. Um, I don't know the status now, but I know it was it has been commissioned, meaning that it should already be producing and supplying electricity to the grid. Um, so we have that in Kano already. I think that's the first, the first grid embed, uh, grid, um, I mean the first embedded um, solar power plant in Nigeria. If there's any other, I don't, I'm not sure about it, but I'm just the one of Kano is one I'm, I'm very quite sure about. They will have off grid, off grid. We're going to look at the different off grid uh, designs and, and and structures. So what, the basic thing between the basic difference between the off grid and the grid connected is what this diagram is, is has depicted. So for the off-grid, you have a solar cell, a solar module that is generating electricity from the sun. Then you pass it through a charge controller. Now, if you need this electricity in DC, you might not need, uh, you might not need an inverter. So like I said, the solar, the solar module generates electricity in the, the DC form of electricity. So it passes through a charge controller. And the reason why you need a charge controller is because of your battery. Okay, we are going to talk about this next Saturday. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, we're going to size a solar system from, we're going to design a solar system from, from the inverter to the PV to the charge controller to the battery. We're going to do all of that by next Saturday. But today we're going to look at all the physical characteristics of the solar system. So you need a charge controller to charge the battery. And the battery now is, uh, the energy is drawn from the battery to the inverter and is converted to AC. In some cases, if you don't need a battery system, then you don't need a charge controller. You can connect your solar system directly to the uh, inverter and inverter will convert it to, um, to AC. But if, that's, if that happens, then you also need, you also may need to, uh, because, because of the fluctuating nature of the sun, <coughs> sorry, because of the fluctuating nature of the sun, it is likely that at some point the sun will go down and there will not be enough supply to the inverter to power the, the load. Okay, and that's why in, in most cases you need a battery system. If you don't have a battery system, you may have a kind of a hybrid design structure where you have to, you know, um, combine energy coming from the solar system with the one coming from the grid. <laughs> you may have to combine what's coming from the solar system or the one that's coming from the grid. Or from a generator. In that case, you have a, a hybrid system or a microgrid. We're going to talk about that. Now, all of these are off-grid systems, but there is also there, there's please excuse me, I need to take water. Okay, so there is also a grid connected system. Now for grid connected system, like I said, for all grid, just like I have already explained for all grid, for grid connected system, you don't need a battery system because you're feeding directly into the grid. So in some cases, it is referred to as grid store. So it's more like you're storing it into the grid. Okay, it's very common in, in some advanced countries like Germany, uh, they've made it so easy that you can easily you know, um, connect your rooftop solar system into the, I mean, your home rooftop solar system into the grid. Okay, and and whatever is generated when you are when you at work or you're not at home, whatever is generated is being fed into the grid. By the night time when you come back, of course the, the sun will not be out, but we need electricity to function. What happens at that time? You collect back from the grid. So at that time, maybe uh, power plants are going to be running. 
But the good thing is that during the day, most industries are working. So they use those renewable energies to power industry during the day. But at night, their yeah, thermal power plants keeps running and it feeds you back in that electricity. At the end of the month, you now compare who has collected more. If you have collected more from the grid, they will bill you for that you have, which you have collected, the excess which you have collected. If you have given more to the grid, then you build the grid will pay you. I mean, the grid operators will pay you. So it's that easy. But it's not yet very, um, it's not happening yet in Nigeria because it needs uh, sophisticated uh, grid infrastructure to make to happen. So here is a, a further breakdown of off-grid and grid-connected PV system. So in off-grid systems, um, PV system for rural electrifications, um, systems with batteries, all of these are off-grid system. I, I don't know if it makes sense for me to read through all of this. You're going to have this slide. You can go through them. I will just run a you know an overview or a just a description of, of any of them. I mean of what is what 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 is being presented. So we have standalone mini grid. We have pure PV, we have hybrid. I have also explained what a hybrid system. Hybrid system is a is a um, is a, an energy system that has multiple sources of supply. You have grid, you have generator, you have solar panels. So all of these are also off-grid system. Now you have a uh, grid connected system. I've explained that you could have, like I, I talked about residential rooftop, which are grid systems that are already common in developed country. Uh, you have commercial, you have central, more like a large solar PV PV plant, like what we have in Kano, which is 10 megawatts. Um, yeah, that is grid connected. So all of that, those ones are grid connected. So grid connected configuration, um, I don't want, because I, there's, there's much for us to talk about. Uh, I don't want to keep repeating myself. I have already described this already when I talked about uh, the uh, the home system that are connected to the grid in developed country. So this is a typical example of that. So we also have grids connected um, that, are, um, that are commercial. That this, in this case, for some, in some cases, we call them solar farms. Uh, in some cases, we call them solar park. But these are all uh, large scale utility grid, um, grid connected systems. And this is the schematic of the grid connected system, which I've already explained for you. You have the solar panels, you have the inverter, they have the meter because, of course, you need to monitor what you're sending to the grid so you can get paid for it. There's need to be a meter, and then there's a main fuse for protection, and it fits into the grid. Sorry, Chima, can I ask a question while we are progressing? Okay, please go on. Solar farm, what is the minimum megawatt that can be generated from there? There's no there's no limit of what you can generate. It's, it's not a question of what the grid can absorb. Um, in So it, it, can, it can be as small as what we have in Nigeria. In fact, it can be as, yeah, as small as what we have in which is 10 megawatt. What we have in Nigeria is 10 megawatt. In some cases, if you go to Ghana, I think Ghana is in over 50 megawatts, uh, I'm solar farm. But in Nigeria, we're still doing about 10 megawatts. I'm not, I'm not sure about that figure from Ghana, but I know in some conversation, I've heard that Ghana is doing about 50 or even more. Uh, mega grid connected uh, um, solar farms or solar park or yeah but in Nigeria we're just doing 10 megawatts but it can be higher it can be more some are doing uh, I mean hundreds of hundreds of megawatts grid connected so I don't think it's there's a limit but it depends on what the grid can take and and of course you, there, there are ways you can uh, in terms of the voltage um, you have to arrange your solar panels in string and, and and combining them in, in, in series and parallel to maintain a, a standard voltage. So there's no limit to what you can actually connect. You know, uh, like I say, it depends on what the grid can absorb and, and the amount of um, the amount of energy you can generate from a particular spot. Yeah, from the amount of energy you can generate from it. I know in Nigeria, there used to be a time where, okay, so for example, um, for low distribution network, I think in Nigeria, I think you cannot generate more than twenty megawatts, uh, and 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 sell to the distribution company and sell to um, is it electric? I don't know, but I'm, I'm not really sure about this. But I'm just trying to based on your question. I know in Nigeria there's a limit at the time from from the old um, uh, power uh, power sector reform act that we had. Um, you cannot generate more than twenty megawatts. 
and not sell to the grid. So if you generate more than 20 megawatts, you must sell to the national grid. National grid. And that was because I think 20 megawatts exceed the current current capacity of certain uh, distribution, uh, certain, yeah, certain network level. So if you do more than 20 megawatts, you must sell to the grid national, which has the absorption capacity. You know, so it, except there are such regulations that it limits the amount of um, solar farm or the capacity of your solar farm. But if it doesn't exist, then you can, you know, um, expand and, you know, as, as, as much as demand you have, you can push into the grid. Okay, so, so sometimes, I think about three, four or five years ago, we were invited and my company was invited for a project that had to do with solar farm at Bauchi State and the Katina State, a place called Kankia and Katina State and then in Bauchi State. Now, they were going to generate 125 megawatt each to be transmitted into the grid. And okay. uh, from, So that was, I was asking whether there is a limit to which. Now they are talking about 10. I think uh, it's another eye-opener to me. Thanks. Okay, yeah, um, you're welcome. So um, now this is this is an off-grid configuration which I have already um, run a brief explanation on. You have your solar panel, uh, uh, it goes through a combiner box where you have multiple solar panels. You need a combiner box to you know, bring all of them together and then fit into a charge controller if you're running a battery system. If you don't, if you don't have a battery system, then you don't need a charge controller, like I said, Charge controller is just to regulate the voltage of what the voltage that is going into your battery. They don't damage your battery system, and you know, for the it's more like a safety measure for your battery to charge and discharge properly. So, because you have a battery in your homes, in your in most off grid system, you need a charge controller. Some inverters come with inbuilt charge controllers. Okay, so but again, if you have an inverter that comes an inbuilt charge controller, you need to look at the capacity of the charge controller. Make sure you don't connect more than the solar panel it can take. You know, in our next class, we're going to look at, in our next slide, we're going to look at all of those things, how we calculate, you know, the capacity of um, solar panel, charge controller, inverter, and batteries. We're going to look at all of that. But for today, let's look at the physical, uh, you know, um, characteristics of, this, of the system. Sorry, the reason I'm skipping all of this right up here, you can read them, you're going to, this material is distributed and you can read them, but essentially I have described what the, their content has. So this is also an off-grid configuration, but this is a mini-grid. In some cases, is my, in fact, most of what we call mini-grid in Nigeria is actually micro-grid because you, you can imagine you have, a, you have a, a system of 30 kilowatts and it's a mini-grid. I mean, one facility alone can take more than, you know, more than that. But of course, you know, we call it mini-grid. You know? So mini-grid, micro-grid, it, it can be used interchangeably, but actually, there are different um, threshold to what you can call a mini grid and what you can call a micro grid. Now, these are basically small electricity grids providing electricity to, for example, a small island or a remote building complex or a village. In Nigeria, in, in the case of Nigeria, it's mostly remote communities that are being powered through mini grids. So here we, we are classifying them as off grid system. They usually have backup power sources, most commonly. A diesel generator. I think it became uh, mandatory if you're running a if you're running a mini grid uh, that is being um, under the RE Rural Electrification Agency. I think at some point it became mandatory that you must have a diesel generator. You must have a generator because of the you know the uncertainty of the solar system. Sometimes um, the sun might not be able to provide enough energy, electricity, and your battery will get drained, and then you leave the community in darkness. So they don't want a situation, such, such situations, you know, to arise. So you must have it, even as much as you may not run it for a long while, but you must have a diesel generator standby, should in case those kind of situations occur. So that's why I said that they usually have a backup sources, most commonly diesel generator. Some larger micro and, and mini grid system do not have battery storage because battery battery storage comes with that with with a, I mean, a high cost. So you have to look at the economic viability of your design. If there are justifications, if there are justifications to avoid the use of battery and still make your project bankable and viable, why not? So electricity is typically produced and stored in a central point from which it is distributed you know, at AC grid voltage. Now let's look at components of um, of a PV system. Please, as I go along, if you 
if the few there's there are area you want me to make further clarification please speak up so that i can i can make uh, more explanation in that area uh, because as i'm as i'm going through my assumption is that this, what i'm most of all gone through so far are basic in as much as it may still be new to some of us and which is the reason why i say if you feel that you need further clarification please call my attention so i can throw you more explanation to them <clears throat> So let us look at the components of a PV system. Now let's come back to the um, solar cell. So select this, now if you look at the picture, you see selected te um, technical character of silicon wafer base and thin film um, solar panels. Essentially we have three kinds of solar panels, solar cells. We have the um, we have the poly, we have the mono, and we have the thin film. Now they all have their own different characteristics and technology has improved, improved a lot um, to the point that for, uh, for the most efficient techno the most efficient solar cell, which is the mono, uh, we can we are not being to see um, uh, efficiency as high as 27. Um, you can see 26, 27, but I think the most you can get now with the current technology is about 27. But it's not just who is drawing on my screen, please. Um, it, it, how do I how do I how do I get rid of this? Otherwise, it, it will remain here. So, so mono, mono, mono is the best uh, um, solar cell in terms of uh, efficiency. And we, as a solar, um, solar, solar engineer or as solar professional, uh, what matters to us more is the efficiency. You know, that's what matters to us more. Um, so many combination of technologies has come together to actually improve this efficiency. And we have spoken about some of them, which, which, I, uh, uh, which I talked about the N-type and the P-type. N type has a higher efficiency. Now, if you combine N type with mono, they, if you now realize that you're gradually increasing the efficiency gradually, okay, up until you get up to right this 27. Now, it can also be um, poly and still be N type or P type. So, the, so a combination of all of this is what actually you know helps to improve the efficiency. But the point is that the higher the efficiency, the more ex, the more expensive it becomes. So you need to find a way to balance you know that extra cost to the yield, to what you're getting and for the purpose of your design. So in some cases, if you're doing a grid connected system, it might make sense to go for the highest efficiency, you know, no matter the cost, because you're, you might, you're, going to, you're going to get more energy out of it and you, because it's, I mean, it's a purely business and it's going to last you longer. You're going to get you know, more money over time than if you're going for residential, you might you know, compromise some certain things because of cost. Now, if you look at this, uh, the third one, you see the thin film. There's another third one, which is the thin film solar panel. And if you look at this picture, the, if you if you go to the market and you look at available solar panels, you can easily tell what kind of um, solar cells they are. So if you see anyone that is bluish, you know, um, uh, without any cut at the edge, those ones are basically poly. They are bluish and they don't have any cut at the edge. But if you see the ones that are, you know, darker and with some cut at their edges, then those ones are mono. Then if you see a dark, uh, uh, dark um, solar solar cells, they most likely they are um, thin thin. I'm saying most likely because I've also seen some dark, you know, solar cells that are not thin thin. They are also mono, but they are, they, are, they are as dark as what you can see on the screen. So it all depends. Sometimes there are some level of treatment that are given to this solar panel. So it is not um, definite. Some of these uh, physical features that you're looking at on your screen are not you know, definite. Sometimes there could be slight you know, variations. So but in terms of um, uh, temperature coefficients, now there's something about solar panels. You know, and it might look um, counterintuitive, uh, because solar 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 panel they pro they produce electricity from sunlight, but again, if the temperature of the on the surface of the solar panel begin to increase, it begins to reduce the amount of electricity that it can generate. If the temperature on their surface increases, it reduces the amount of electricity that it can generate from them. Okay, so then there's all called temperature coefficient. So for every rise in temperature, how much? reduction in electricity can you get so it's important that when you look at so when you look at the, the the nameplate or you, the technical details of a solar system or solar modules you will see all of these things they are all stated there so the temperature coefficient in terms of temp temperature coefficient same film has a higher tolerance for higher temperature 
compared to Mono and Poli. And of course, but Thin film is not very popular. It's it has a very low share of the market, uh, very low um, share of the market uh, market size. So let's move forward. So when you combine solar cell, now this this box you're seeing is a solar cell. When you combine them in a you know in, in, in a in a model, you have a PV model. So we have more of these PV models. You have a PV array or a solar array. Okay. Now PV models are formed by connecting PV cells in series or in parallel and encasing them in a photovoltaic material. PV models can also be connected in series and or in parallel in order to form PV array. Now the number of models determine the maximum power generation capacity of the PV plant. There's another important thing that I need to talk about, which is the half cut. Remember I said that when you get to the market, you see so many terminologies. But all of these are technological involvements to improve the efficiency of solar panel. Now, what matters most is the efficiency of the solar panel, okay? Of course, there are other things that matter, which is the, uh, the lifespan, the, 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 the level, the degradation over time. So for some of them now, the, most of the recent technology that we have now, um, for the first year, degradation will be like 1%. Okay, but the subsequent year is going to be 0.4%. Now, before now, we have 0.5% degradation every year. But now, improvement technology has improved so much that for the first year, you can have 1% degradation. And then for the subsequent years, you have 0.4% degradation. Okay, so if you do the mathematics, find out that solar panels can last over 25 years, even going into 30 years because of this you know, improvement in technology. Now, Improvement in efficiency has also been, been noticed significantly. Solar panels efficiency has improved a lot. And what has happened that there is the combination of so many technologies, like we've talked about the N-type and the P-type. We've talked about, um, what again? Uh, now we've talked about the, uh, there's this other one that, I don't know if I've, I've spoken about it or it's in the in the latest, but now let's focus on the half cut. Now, why do we have half cut? If you notice when I when I talked about the solar cells, it comes in full in full square like this, okay. But again, you now see that if you go to the market, you begin to see half cut. So they cut it into half. Why is it done so? Now it is also done to improve efficiency. Now remember that um, as as electrons travel through the cable, there's resistance, and those resistance leads, leads to losses. You know, increases the losses of um of the L, uh, of the electricity that has been pushed through. Now if you if you keep pushing electrons through this whole length, through this whole length, the losses will increase because you're going to have accumulation of more electrons. And the more, the higher electrons you have, the higher your losses. And that is the reason, that is the brain behind this half cut. So that this electron doesn't have to travel all through this length. So it travels into half and the losses are reduced. And then this will also travel by half. I mean, through this half length and the losses are also reduced. So you reduce the level of losses and then you increase the output of the solar, solar cells. That's the essential reason. That's the thinking behind this half cut. And all of these are the combination of what has kept on increasing the efficiency of solar models. But of course, it also comes with you know, um, some a little bit of a higher price. Now, let us also understand something about solar models. Now, if you have a complete solar model, uh, the traditional solar model that we used to have, you know, some years ago, uh, what usually happens is that if you have, now, this is a concept of shading. If you have any shade on your solar panel, so if, if, even if you have, um, so for example, if you have, um, okay, let me just focus on one model. Now, this is one solar model. If, you, if there's any uh, dead, dead leaf falls on this solar cell, this very one at this edge, if there's any dead leaf that falls on it and cover this solar cell, what usually happens in the traditional solar model is that the entire solar, mo solar model, the, the output will be reduced to the output of this very one that has shed on it, that has um, the dead leaf on top of it. The entire cell output will be reduced to this very one. But over time, the, uh, the, the, the technology, the, the concept of uh, uh, diodes, started in coming in into solar, uh, solar modules. So solar modules are now being divided into three. Okay, so you have, you have these two lines, 
you, you have a diode, you know, across it. Then you have the next two line, you have a diode across it, and you have the next two line, you have a diode across it. Now, what this diode does is that if there's a shedding in one of these cells, only this two line will be affected. The remaining two thirds of the solar panel will still work normally. But this one third will not work effectively. It will be reduced. The output from this one third will be reduced because of this shedding in one cell, just in one of these cells, we reduce the shedding in these two in these two lines. That's one third of it will be, will be reduced. Now, compared to before, where you don't have a diode, what will happen is that you will reduce the entire model, you know, you reduce the output of the entire model. But this diode has now come in place and helped the situation so that even if this happens, two third of your solar model will still work. Now, if you have multiple solar models in, in one string, okay, and this kind of thing happen, what will also happen is that all the solar models in that string will be reduced. But because of the diode, once this thing happens, it's only going to affect this. Every other solar panel, every other model will work optimally. And that is the, you know, that's the, the, the purpose of having diode in your solar models. Now, how does this apply to half cut? How does also, how does this also help improve the efficiency of half cut solar models? Now, this is a half cut solar model. You notice that these ones are full cell, but these ones are half cut. Okay. Now, what happens is that if there's a shedding in one of these cell, okay, what is going to be what is going to be covered here is one sixth. Here is one third, right? But this one is the one sixth. So a smaller portion of the entire model is what is going to be reduced. Then five over six of the solar model will still uh, work optimally, okay? So this is the importance of um, having uh, half cut, how it improves uh, in terms of um, shading, how it improves the shading of solar models, in terms of output, how it also improves the efficiency of solar model. But of course, like I always say, it also comes with a little bit of a higher price. Now let's talk about inverters. An inverter converts direct current into direct direct current input from the PV array or battery into alternating current output. Remember when we talked about electrical basics, we, we also discussed there are two kinds of electricity. There is direct current, there is alternating current. So inverter converts direct current into an alternating current. And this is just an illustration of what that uh, what is happening. The sun comes through a PV 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 array, and the PV array output is in DC. It goes into an inverter, and it comes out as a an AC uh, alternating current. You can fit into the grid, or you can use to power your equipment. PV modules produce produces um, only DC. However, electrical energy is usually transmitted and distributed in AC in AC form, and most appliances also consume. AC power, so that's the that's the work of inverter in the system. Now we have different kinds of inverter, okay? Depending on on your design, and it's very important that we understand these kinds of inverter and at the level where we can actually implement them. There is what we call micro inverter. Micro inverter. Now remember that your PV modules produces direct current. You can actually attach micro inverter to the individual PV system so that. As it is producing direct current, it is also being converted into direct current at the PV level. If you do this, so this also help when you is also help in the in, remember when, when we talked about the concept of shading. It also help in the shading scenario. If you have shading, so you have multiple PVs in multiple PV models in one string. Remember that if there's any shading on any cell of that string, it affects the entire string. Assuming you don't have a diode in that PV model. If you have a diode in the PV model, then you can avoid this. Alternatively, if you have micro inverters that pass directly to every module, what we also have is that if there's a shading on any cell, it's only going to affect that module, not the entire module in that string. So this is also one of the advantage of Micro inverter. It is fixed directly on the solar model. So in this case, so for, for the case of micro inverter, you, you're go, you, for every solar model, you're going to have an, a micro inverter attached to it. So you have 
several inverter on this on the model. They will have a string inverter. Now, string inverter means that you have so many so several models attached to one inverter. You know, um, you have several models attached to one inverter. So that is the what we call string. for most grid connected system, many of the grid connected system actually uh, are done in string in strings. So you have multiple of the PVs, um, PV modules connected to one inverter. They have another set of multiple PV panels modules connected to another inverter. And in the end, I mean, you convert this uh, inverters to, uh, to AC current and you feed into your grid or you feed into, uh, you, you, you connect every, every, every one of them into a transformer, depending if you want to step up the voltage to feed into a higher voltage um, distribution network. So it all depends, but again, for the string inverters, you have multiple PV models connected to one inverter. They will have a central inverter. We, in this case, all the PV models you know, fit into one inverter. So you have so many strings that are connected to one inverter. So let us look at mounting structures. So the fundamental requirement of mounting structure are that they must support the weight of the PV modules. They must distribute the load evenly onto the roof or on the ground below, and they must withstand expected extra loading from wind or snow, if it's in snowy country. Um, there's a picture I once saw on the internet uh, where a solar panel collapsed you know, the roof of a building. So it's important that before you do your installation, you need to look at the roof, you need to be sure that uh, the 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 uh, that the the, um, the 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 integrity of the structure is not threatened because you have solar installations on the roof, okay. So you need to look at the structural integrity of the building and be sure that it can carry the weight because solar panel um, has weight. Uh, um, yeah, it has weight. So you need to be sure that the the building and especially when you are not having multiple of the solar modules on the roof. So you need to be sure that the building itself can withstand that load. So it's very, very important, you know, when you're considering the mountain structure. So if the building is not is weak or the, is not strong enough, to, you might need to consider ground mount. Even even though, um, of course, ground is uh, land is premium, and you know, depending on the area, if there is no uh, available space, you might need to do some kind of reinforcements to be sure that the uh, uh, the structural integrity of the building is not compromised. So since large array structure, including the modules, are heavy, it is necessary to seek the advice of a structural engineer prior to roof mountain. The structure should have optimal orientation and tilt angle to maximize power output and all shading should be avoided. The structure will typically be made from aluminum and galvanized steel. Pendant steel and wood are also option, though such structures will probably require more maintenance over the 20 plus year lifetime of a solar system. It is important that when we are dealing with solar system, we should, we should, whatever we are putting in our design or in our construction, we should look at the lifetime of this project. It's very, very important. This project is project that is going to last for over twenty years. So, if you're doing your, if you if you want to maybe recommend or you want to, you know, construct your mountain structures, it does not make sense that you use wood that over time it will decay, it the uh, it will deteriorate on the weight of the solar panel and the project will collapse. So it's important that we use, you know, um, galvanized steel that has the same, you know, um, if a longer lifespan than the solar model so that you're sure that your solar system can last the test of time. So solar panels can be installed on a fixed support or a tracker. Um, in some time, because the sun does not just stay in one place, the sun also moves, it rises from the east and sets in the west. So. And of course, you know that um, how if how do I put it? Uh, if the sun is hitting your solar panel, if the sun is and your solar panel is at a uh, is at a perpendicular angle, that is where you get the optimal or the highest you know uh, um, yield from that solar panel. If if, they are, if both of them are in perpendicular uh, angle. Uh, then you can, meaning that, the, I mean, the angle between them is 90 degrees, then you can get the maximum yield from that solar panel. But of course, that's, oh, that's rarely the case. But to help achieve this kind of, you know, um, um, optimum yield, 
then some te some uh, technologies has introduced what called tracker. So it means that you have to follow the sun, and the sun is moving. It keeps following the sun, you know, you know, up to make sure that you know it achieves that maximum yield at every point in time. So fixed supports are most often directed toward the south in the northern hemisphere and vice versa. We're going to talk about this. Uh, if you're going to do your solar system, how do you, um, what, where do you face your solar panel to make sure that you get the highest, you know, um, yield, especially if it's a fixed mountain structure. There was something again that I, 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 I want, I, I, I should have, I wanted to talk about, we talk about, sorry, um, okay, in, in, still, still, still a mountain structure. Sometimes you get to a building, you want to mount a solar system on a building, on a roof, and then you find out that the roof is, the angle of inclination of the roof is not, is such that it's not going to, you know, um, it's not going to give you the, the, the best uh, output from the solar panel. In that case, what do you do? Are you going to ask the owner of the roof to go and change the, the angle of, because you know the kind of roof we have in Nigeria these days, you know, this kind of send down the road, this very, you know, elongated roof, and you want to mount solar panels on those kind of roof. You know, you're not going to ask the owner of the building to go and change the roofing of his building. And, and in most cases, there's no there's no grant space to do grand mount solar system. Even if you have grant space, they have you know shadows from the buildings or nearby buildings. So you have limited options. So in those cases, you just have to go ahead and mount on those roofs because if you look at the cost of okay, another thing you can do is to use some um mounting rays uh, to adjust the angle. Yeah, exactly. So I was going to say you can use you know all those uh, 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 those support those angular um, um, structures to you know to adjust the angle. But again, you have to look at the cost and you know the extra yield. Now remember that if you mount it on the roof the way it is, you're still going to get some. You're still going. You're still going to get solar yield. So you're not going to check the extra yield that you're going to get by using those angular supports and the cost. If it makes sense, please go ahead and do it. So that's that's that would be my own advice. So sorry, and, sorry. Can I can, sorry? Can I make an inquiry? Uh, sorry, can I ask a question? Okay, please go. Now, in order to get this, uh, the angle that you're talking about now. Okay. If, for instance, the roof that you 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 want to install this your panel on does not have that kind of inclination that you're talking about, maybe somehow it's uh, flat. I see a situation where somebody had to use a, um, it's kind of improvise something to to raise one side up so that. They can get an inclination. Um, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, it just so, improvise. It's not as if it's a, it's, a, it's come along with. It just improvise something with which to just raise one side of it up so that it can get uh, and the kind of inclination is is, is requiring. So I'm so asking, what, what what do you have to say about that? Yes, um, we are actually going to come to that. We we will talk about tilt angle. We are going to talk about this. Are going, I will address this. We will come to talk about tilt angle. Um, just bear with me. We, I think it's in the next section. We're going to talk about it. Um, it's included here. You know, um, there are situations where you also meet a flat roof. What do you do? But we're going to talk about because this the whole thing depends on the um, depend on on the location you're talking. If it's uh, the northern hemisphere or in the southern hemisphere, I mean, it, it depends on the location or where it lies on the equator. That determines your tilt angle. So we're going to look at it and they look at different you know, angle that you could meet. Or different kind of uh, system that you commit when you go to site. So just there, we are going to talk about that. So now talking about um, tracker, there are two kinds of tracker. There are tracker that move from you know uh, just a straight line like south to west or east. Uh, um, I mean south to north or east to west in that direction. And there are dual directions that move in all four directions. So it all depends. But of course, you know that like the more you know, direct directions you have the higher the X. And of course, this is a mechanical system, which means that they need regular maintenance. Otherwise, they might also fail. So physical aspect of the PV system. Now we have to the solar cell. When you get a solar module and you look behind, you're going to see so many, so many things, so many technical um, terms. So we're going in this section. We're going to describe all of those technical terms. You're going to see. Uh, um, okay, let's just let's just go on. I mean, I, I, I will introduce them, you know, along the line of this presentation. So the electrical power P. Now, 
in the first um in the first section of this training we talked about in the our electrical basic we talked about this um, power equation is a very basic power equation that anybody needs to know you don't it doesn't matter if you are a technical person you are engineer or not engineer if you need to do solar installation if you need to um do energy uh, audit energy calculation you need to know this power is equal to voltage times current is the basic power is equal to voltage times current right now the electrical power p for dc system measured in what that is w is the product of voltage measured in volt and current measured in ampere now all of these are just grammar like i said power is equal to voltage times current now under normal sunlight condition the p V cells, the PV cells voltage remains fairly constant. Now, we have your solar model and the sun comes out in the morning. Now, the voltage, which is the V here, remains almost constant. It's not constant, but it almost it changes slightly. You know, even if the sun comes out heavy, it, the sun dims, it changes slightly, but it almost remains at the same, I mean, within the same range, right? Now, so what will normally change is the current, which is this current. Power is equal to voltage times current, right? Voltage will re almost remain constant, but current will always change depending on the intensity of the sun. If the sun increases, what actually increases is the current. If the sun reduces, what reduces is the current. The voltage change, it doesn't remain constant, but the change is not significant. We're going to see how, we're going to see that in a diagram anyway. So now the surface area of a PV cell also affects the electric output. If you have more surface area, the more current you will produce. Remember the voltage remains almost the same, or uh, yeah, almost the same, not exactly the same, but almost the same. But what actually changes is your current. So if you have more PV, PV space, uh, PV surface, you produce more current. A cell with a large surface area will produce more electric current than a cell with a smaller surface. So if you want to increase your energy output, you increase the space, I mean, the, the surface area of your PV model. That's what this is, just simply saying. Though so the two main factors that affect the output of a PV model are the intensity of the sunlight falling on it and the size of the PV cell or, or the size of the cell. Other factors are also important and will be discussed in the following sections. Now let's also look at what we call the um, IV curve. <clears throat> now this, this is a bit technical, but uh, I, I'm sure everyone of us can understand it. We call this the IV curve. If you look at your, remember I said that if you look at the back of your solar panel, you see so many technical terms. We need to understand what those things mean so that when you go out to the market and you see those things, you know exactly what they mean and you can all interpret them and then you know use them to your, to your project design. Okay? Now, the, PV, the IV curve. Now, the IV curve describes an important electrical characteristic of a PV cell. At any given time, a PV cell is operating with a specific current and voltage. Remember, power is equal to voltage times current, which lies along the IV curve. And it is the red line in the graph. If you look at this red line, this is the IV curve. The red line is the IV curve. Okay, but there are other things that has to do with this graph. Now this line shows the current, the current I, which is produced over a range of voltages. There's what we call ISE, ISC, which represents short circuit current. Remember that I is ampere, which is the current. Now S means short circuit. Short, so IS means short circuit current. That is the value at which the current is at maximum and the voltage is equal to zero. Now, let me see how I can explain that. Now, if, now this, if you look at this graph, the vertical line here is the current, and the horizontal line here is the voltage. Again, this vertical line is the current, this, horizon, this horizontal line is the voltage. Now, this is IV curve, the red line. This red curve is IV curve. Okay, now if this horizontal line is the voltage, okay, now let's now follow this analogy. Just follow this illustration, please. At the point when this voltage is maximum, when you have the highest voltage, 
what becomes the value of your current? This is your voltage. It is the maximum here. What becomes the value of your uh, of your current? Current is zero. 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 Exactly. Power is zero because current is zero. Exactly. Is... Exactly. Yeah. So thank you. So now this is where you have your maximum voltage and your current is what? Zero. Now this is your current. Okay. Now this is the point where you have your maximum current. Right? What becomes the value of your voltage? Voltage At is zero. Point, is zero. zero. Okay, okay. So finally, remember, remember this formula. P is equal to voltage times current. So when your voltage is maximum, your current is zero. So your power is also zero. When your current is maximum, your voltage is zero. So your power becomes zero. So the, here, here lies the problem. At what point in this red line would you have would you have a combination of current and voltage that will give you the maximum power, right? What at what point along this line would you have current and voltage that will yield you that will yield the maximum power? Okay. Now let me also explain some a concept here. At this point, where you have the voltage to be maximum and your current is zero, the condition the condition this condition is referred to as open circuit voltage open there's the, the circuit is open there's no current that is being drawn but voltage is maximum current is zero now at this point where you have the highest current but voltage is zero here is called short circuit current short circuit current so here you have maximum current but voltage is zero Okay. Now, but we want a point where we can combine current and voltage to get the maximum power, which is P, along this line. Okay, and that has been established to be here. You see this red dot? It has been established here. Now, I want you to follow this. I want you to follow this illustration. Let us prove if this red dot is correct or not. Now, if you begin to move this red dot, if you begin to move it down, what is happening? You're actually reducing your current and increasing your voltage. Correct? So if you reduce, if you reduce your if you reduce your current and increases your voltage, power will not increase because you're increasing one and you're reducing one. And again, the the rate of reducing the rate of reducing the current is high compared to the rate of reducing the voltage. If you decide to move it up, if you decide to shift it further up, you'll be reducing the voltage, but you'll be increasing the current. I don't know if this is not. Now, for many of us, if you go to the market, you will have heard of MPP or MPPT. It's a very common you know, um, um, term when you go out to, when you go out to uh, especially if you're talking about uh, inverters, you, know, you talk about MPP, MPPT, right? MPPT means maximum power point tracker. Okay? Maximum power point. That's what MPP means, right? Now, this point here, at this point, you have your, cor your current is at maximum, your voltage is at maximum. So this is your current maximum power point current. And this is your maximum power point voltage here. And that is what we have here. If you see this equation, your maximum power point is equal to your maximum power point voltage times your maximum power point current. That will give you your maximum power point. Now we are going to we are going to uh, we are going to see further illustration about this. But if there is any confusion here, please ask. Let me explain further. Um, otherwise, I will just move. The, the following slide also touches on this to make us understand this better. Uh, but at this point, if you still have, if you feel there's a question, please let me know. Now let us look at the factors affecting the power output. Now we are still looking at the electrical, characteristic, electrical characteristics and the IV core. Now there are three critical factors which affect the instantaneous output of a PV cell. The first one is the solar irradiance incident on the surface. The second one is the temperature of the PV cell. 
And the third one is the electrical resistant resistance connected to the PV module or the PV cells. We are going to focus on the two, on the first two. Now let's look at the importance of the irradiance. Irradiance is the sun that is falling on the solar cell, on the solar panel. That is the sun, the intensity of the sun, the intensity of the sun falling on the solar cell. Now remember when I told you that, now remember that this is voltage. This, this line is voltage. This line is current. Okay. Now, once the sun comes out in the morning, the voltage just gets to its, you know, uh, uh, gets to its value. If the sun keeps increasing, you can see that what actually increases so much is the current. You see that the voltage does not increase so much. So if you look at the technical data sheet of any PV model, you see this diagram. They will always give you this diagram. And it's important that you understand what this diagram means because it's part of the technical data you're going to be seeing in the solar PV model. Now, what this means is that once the sun comes out in the morning, the voltage remains almost stable. You can see that here. Even though the current has increased from you know, 0 0.5, or 0 0.6 up onto three, the voltage has only moved from about um, 18 uh, to 20 something, right? About 18 to 23 or so. So the voltage slightly moved based on the irradiance of the sun. So this is how irradiance affects the output of solar PV model. So the higher the irradiance, the higher the current, and the higher the current, the higher the power output. I think uh, uh, this is just the right up to explain the diagram to help you understand what you read on your own. In, um, so I don't think I need to go through this anymore. Now let's also look at the impact of temperature. Now, temperature affects voltage more than current. Temperature of the PV model hardly affects, it hardly affects the current. So this is what the IV curve is telling us. Now, remember that this is the voltage. This diagram is like the reverse of the previous one that we've seen. So once the temperature increases, the temperature of your PV model increases, it affects, it deteriorates, it reduces your voltage. It reduces, I mean, the, the, the voltage of your, of your PV model. And once the voltage reduces, what also happens? It affects the power. Remember that our power is equal to voltage times current. So if voltage reduces, it reduces the power output from your PV model. And that's why high temperature also leads to um, uh, reduction of your PV output. As you can see here, if the temperature moves from, um, uh, the temperature, now this is 25 degrees centigrade. If the temperature increases to, uh, okay, now this is zero. So at zero degrees centigrade, this is your voltage, right? If your temperature goes down, if your temperature goes down, this is minus, not 25. I thought it's 25. Now this is minus 25. So if your temperature goes to minus 25, right, your voltage increases. But if your temperature increases from zero degrees to 25, your voltage will drop. If your temperature increases from 25 to 50 degrees, your voltage will drop further. If it increases to 75, your voltage will even drop further. So increasing, increasing temperature reduces your voltage. And once your voltage reduces, your power output from your solar panel reduces. And that's why for thin solar system is better in a high temperature regions. However, um, it, technology has improved a lot for monocrystalline and polycrystalline that you can now use them for those kind of you know, high temperature regions. So this is just the explanation of what I've you know, illustrated so far. Any questions so far? No question. Okay, so that means that we are all we all understood the the explanation. Now let's all look at the standard test conditions. Why is it that when you get a solar panel in Nigeria, um, okay, you raise your hand, Emmanuel. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I raised my hand for a question. Okay, uh, please you know, go. Like uh, some of us, you know, big based on uh, this solar installation, we have this. Uh, uh, thinking of the higher the sun, uh, the more uh, efficient the panel or the module is going to perform. Like I used to have the feeling of okay, during people in the north now, you know, having using 
a solar panel that will be benefiting so much from, you know, the sun based on high uh, availability of sunshine there. But what you've just explained, the temperature, um, the temperature, high temperature getting to reduce the voltage. Uh, is it the temperature caused by the sun or maybe other factors? Because I don't know how that one would uh, work in the real life installation, the real okay. world installation, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's another, someone has raised his hand. Yeah, his hand also. I didn't get the name. Please go on uh, because I'm sharing my screen, so I'm not. I, I can't see the name for now. Go on, please. Yeah, I buy. It popped out that someone wrote his hand. I just want to take the question so I can answer answer everyone at the same time. Okay, no one else. Okay, fine. Um, so like I said, it sounds counterintuitive that okay, the sun that actually improves your um the energy yield of your solar system is also reducing the output. Now here is it. Here is what happens. Once the temperature, once the sun intensity of the sun increases, it increases the it increases the the the, the currents, right? It increases the current, but as the temperature increase, as, as the sun intensity increases. It also increases the the, uh, the temperature of this of, of the solar cells, and once the temperature of the solar cells increases, it reduces the voltage. Now here is here is what happens: the rate at which the current increases is significant compared to the rate at which the voltage is dropping. So the current that is increasing is much higher compared to the voltage drop. So the voltage drop might so for example the voltage might the voltage drop might be minus zero point. Uh, 0 0.36, depending on the type of solar cell, it can be minus, it can be 0 0.36 per, per degree rise in temperature. So you can have about maybe 30 degree rise in temperature before you get to one, one, uh, one volt drop, you know, in the, in the voltage. But the current can increase significantly. So you have a higher gain in as much as voltage we try to reduce that gain. But of course, you would definitely overall, you have a higher gain in the output of the solar model. Okay, uh, thank you. Just explain to, to that. In other words, these three type of panels that you've explained, if we go through the document, we should be able to like um, um, figure out the ones that are more resistant in terms of choice and cost and all that. Maybe if we settle down and look at the documents uh, for, for all the types of solar panels. So what I try to do here is to make yeah. you understand this terminology, just like you already yeah. understand these terminologies. Yeah. When you go out in the market, there are tech. In fact, if you go online, I wish that I would have enough time to just go through some of the technical data sheet of the solar panels in the market. Yeah. Every technical data sheet has all of this data. This detail, I'm telling you. If you go through the technical data, you will see the temperature coefficients. It's always stated there. Not on, not on the sticker on the panel. The sticker on the panel, you will see the VOC. The ISC, all those uh, short cycle voltage and, short, and MPP, uh, um, a maximum current, a maximum uh, power point current, maximum power point. You see all those on at the sticker of your panel. You see those on. But when you now download the technical data sheet of your solar model, you will see a lot more technical detail. You will see the uh, uh, the temperature coefficients and all of these details that I'm talking about. You see them there. Okay. Thank you. So what I'm trying to find out is this. Are you saying that detailed technical uh, data for any of this panel, depending on the type that you are using, is not on the body of the panel, maybe as a, as a kind of a template on it? Not complete. Like I said, you see the bed, you see the efficiency. Possibly you see the efficiency on the, on, on the you know, those stickers that you see behind it it, it, it contains a lot of information, but not all the information that you will need. As a technical person, if you want to dive deep into the technical yes. details of the solar panel, it yeah. contains it con what you're going to see behind contains the maximum power point output. Uh, okay. Yeah, the maximum power point, the maximum power point voltage, the maximum power okay. point current, okay. the open circuit voltage, the open circuit current, uh, the open circuit op uh, short circuit current. So it has all of these details so that you know, you know what you're getting out of this panel now. What is important is the maximum power point output in these solar panels. 
Okay, right. so another question. I, another question I would like to ask is this. Um, this sorry, maybe I may have lost out. These panels sometimes their sizes varies. Okay. So, what is the significance? What role does that play? Is it the bigger the, the, the size, the, the the greater the efficiency, or what is it all about? Not necessarily. Um. So the for for mono. Uh, for mono, if you have a higher efficiency, what you're going to actually do is that you have a smaller, a smaller size of the of the panel. If if you have a greater efficiency, you should have. So for the same size of solar panel, for the same size of solar panel, the one with the higher efficiency will give you higher yield. The one with lower efficiency will give you a lower yield. So it all depends. They all comes in different sizes, you know, different dimensions. They all comes in different dimensions. But if you take the same dimension, the one with a higher efficiency will give you a higher energy output compared to the one with a lower um, lower efficiency. And that is what matters more. Um, efficiency here means that the amount of sunlight that is falling on that solar panel that is converted to electricity, that's what the efficiency means. The amount of sunlight falling or amount of sunlight incident on that solar panel or solar module that is being generated, that is being converted to electricity. So, the remaining percentage of the sun that is falling on that solar panel is converted to heat. Some of them are reflected back. Okay. Now there is a technology I also want to talk about. I think I, I, I had wanted to mention it. I was trying to remember it when I was talking about solar module, but it just came back to me now. There's what I call PERC, PEC, and there's what I call TOPCON. These are new innovations in solar systems. Now, I remember it because of the question you asked. Now, when a sunlight hits on a solar panel, some of them penetrate, some of them penetrate through the cell and they are lost. So what uh, innovators have done, they, they put another layer behind it to reflect it back to the cells to capture in more energy. So the technology that they used to achieve that is PE, PE, uh, PERC, PEC, and TOPCON. These are, in fact, TOPCON is the latest technology in solar models now, TOPCON. So if you combine TOPCON, and type and by facial, you can see that all of these are efficiency gain. For every one of them is efficiency gain. So if you combine all of this, you keep improving your efficiency of the solar panel. But of course, it comes with a higher cost. Remember what I said, if you combine the technology, that is top con, which is the higher uh, um, technology in terms of you know getting more out of your solar um, solar cells. So what top con and PERC, what they do is that they add another layer on, on in your solar cells to redirect some of the some of the some of the rays that escape from your from your from your model, they redirect it back to the cell to capture in more energy. So those are the technologies. So if you combine this top coin, you combine the um, end type. Remember when I talked about the end type that the end type is a more efficient technology. If you combine the bifacial, I, I don't know if I talked about bifacial, but bifacial is that you're generating energy both from the front and the back side of your solar panel. If you combine that, and you also combine it with half cut. If you combine all of this together, you find out that you begin to shoot your efficiency to up to 27, right? Compared to what you can regularly get in the market, which is about 22%, 23 at best, you can get in a regular market. But if you combine all of this technology, you get higher efficiency. But of course, it comes at a cost. Okay, so let's continue. I, I just wanted to add that because when you go out, you also hear some of these things. Uh, if you go out to, to some exhibitions or if you go out to meet some manufacturers, you will definitely hear things like top corn. You hear um, by fish here, you hear half cut. So when you hear some of this, you understand what they mean. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I want you to enlighten me more on the this terminology, NOC, NOCT, which is nominal operating set temperature. Maybe you can also expand it on that temperature versus uh, voltage. So nominal, nominal operating set temperature. Um, now we are coming to standard test condition. Maybe I will talk about it in standard test condition. Okay, we are already in standard test condition. Yeah. Okay. So I will I will, okay. I will talk about it here. Yeah. All right. No problem. Okay. Thank you. So um, there's what called standard test condition. Now before a manufacturer can say a solar panel is rated 300 watts, 400 watts, or 500 watts, the question is at what condition did you test it to establish that this solar panel can actually produce this? So this is what we call standard test condition. So if you take that solar panel and install it in Nigeria, if you take that solar panel and install it in Germany, 
at the same standard test condition, you will get that same value. But once these standard test conditions begin to deviate, the, the value begins to change. So let us look at what that means. So due to the variability of power output of PV cells, depending on parameters such as irradiance and temperature, the performance of different cells operating under different conditions can, cannot, cannot be compared easily, okay? Now, in order to enable meaningful comparison between PV cells or PV models, the rated output of a cell or model is always measured under specific conditions. These conditions are standardized across all testing facilities, all testing facilities worldwide, and are called standard test condition. Now for many, for, for okay, let me, let me not digress, you know, at this point, so I don't create confusion. Now these are the standard test condition. Now the STC parameters are these three things. There are three items. So these solar panels are tested under this condition. This, the temperature condition, which boils down to what uh, uh, the other colleague was, the uh, engineer was asking, is the temperature. Now the temperature at standard test condition is 25 degrees centigrade. 25 degrees centigrade. In some solar panel, they will give you the operation, the operating range, the operating, operating temperature range, right? Uh, between maybe some, maybe they will give you a range. That this is the operating nominal operating temperature of the echo, of, of of the of the solar panel of the solar model, right? However, the, the the rating of that solar model was determined under standard test condition of 25 degrees centigrade. And it was exposed to irradiance of 1,000 watts per meter square. It was exposed to 1,000 watts per meter square and air mass, that is the light spectrum of 1.5. What's very important here is in order to the irradiance and the cell temperature. One, uh, 25 degrees centigrade and irradiance of 1,000 watts per meter square. So if you expose that cell to these conditions, what was the output? The output is what we call standard test condition. And that's what the manufacturer will stick to the panel that this is what the panel is rated. So if you take that solar panel, even if you take it to Germany, US, Nigeria, or anywhere, and you expose it to this condition, you get that same output. But again, remember what we said, once this temperature begins to increase, when the temperature increases to 26, the voltage will begin to drop and the power will begin to reduce. So it will no longer give you to uh, 300 watts. If it's a 300 watt rated solar module, it will no longer give you 300 watts, right? Now, if the irradiance is not up to 1,000 watts, you know the uh, uh, the output will also be reduced. It will not give you 300. If it's 300 rated watts panel, it will not give you 300 watts. So it's important that we understand we understand this. However, if the temperature reduces below 25 degrees centigrade, it is possible you can actually generate more than 300 watts. If it's rated 300 watts, it is possible that that solar panel can generate more than 300 watts if the temperature reduces below 25 degrees centigrade. So each finished PV cells or PV modules leaving the production line undergoes a flash test. It is exposed to a flash of light under careful control, under careful control of a standard test condition parameters, lasting only milliseconds and the output performance is recorded. Subsequently, the cell, is, the cell or module are sorted and sold according to their rated power. The rated power is measured in units of watt peak or kilowatt peak and referred to the rated power under standard test condition. Now let's talk about temperature coefficient. Now what does temperature coefficient mean? The temperature coefficient shows how voltage current or power output of a PV cell or model change with changing temperature. I already explained what this is, right? Now, once the temperature begins to increase, the voltage begins to drop. <clears throat> so if you look at the technical data sheet, you're going to see the temperature coefficient. What that tells you is that for every rise in temperature, this is the amount of voltage you're going to lose. And that's what I try to explain here. Model data sheet gives temperature coefficient for open circuit voltage under standard test condition, short circuit current under standard test condition, and the power at maximum power point. Remember, I told you that what you're looking at, what actually matters is the maximum power point at standard test condition.
So the voltage temperature coefficient is the most common one used. Inverters and other devices such as the charge controllers can be damaged by modules or string voltage that exceed the specified input voltages of these inverters and other devices. Conversely, if the voltage is too low, this can cause system underperformance. So this is how temperature um, coefficient looks like. You will see something like, uh, so voltage, uh, voltage temperature coefficient are given in the form of example, minus 0 0.156 voltage per degree centigrade or minus 156 millivolt per degree centigrade or, or as percentage, which is, um, or percentage per degree uh, temperature. Example, 0 0.36 degree, 0.36% per degree cent centigrade. So these are the various forms in which temperature coefficients have been uh, you know, uh, indicated in technical data sheet of solar models. There's also current temperature coefficient. Now, when I talked about temperature coefficient, I said that it affects voltage mainly, but it does not mean that it does not affect current as well, but the rate at which it affects current is so minimal that it's negligible. Okay, so we hardly don't focus on, you know, how temperature affects current. What affects current the more is the, is, is the irradiance. You know, once the irradiance drops, the current drops. Once the irradiance increases, the current booms. However, for, for voltage, is, 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 uh, is temperature. Once the temperature increases, the voltage drops. Once the temperature drops, the voltage increases. So this is a calculation exercise. Um, I don't know if we have, we, don't have, we really don't have so much time. However, I will, I will encourage you at your own time to go through this again, even if it's just once. Look at this calculation. They are very straightforward and simple calculation. Unless you don't understand what I've explained about, you know, power coefficient, um, temperature coefficient. If you understand what I, and, and my explanation about open circuit voltage. Now, um, Open circuit voltage will always be higher than the uh, maximum power point voltage. That is already obvious from the diagram that I showed initially. At when I showed you that when open circuit voltage is maximum and current is zero, you can see that you know. And when we you now have the we now have the MPP that is the maximum power point, it's happening at a reduced voltage. Okay, so but what is more important here that you understand what open circuit voltage is. You understand what a maximum power point is. You understand what a short circuit current is. If you don't understand any of this, please let me know so I can, you know, explain that again. So these are calculation exercises that I have included. Um, if we had time, we'll have just gone through some of them. But like I said, this is the straightforward calculations. Um, of now the calculation is maybe trying to say, okay, um, now let's let's look at one of them. What will be the maximum open circuit? Open now this open um sorry oh yeah open circuit uh, voltage. Okay, so this is what is the maximum what is the maximum open circuit voltage produced by the module? Now this is the characteristics of the module of the model, the maximum open circuit voltage will be produced at the lowest ambient temperature. Now, the lowest ambient temperature is minus 10. Remember I told that uh, at standard test condition, um, at standard test condition, the, 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 the temperature is 25. So if you have minus 10, it means that your, 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 your voltage is actually improving, is increasing because the temperature is dropping. So the lowest cell temperature will be at minus uh, minus ten degrees centigrade. Now this calculation is now uh, our open circuit voltage is minus ten. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see if this is coming from. Okay, so what you actually see here is the, is the solution is the solution to, um, to, to, to to this question that we, that that, that we have shown here. 
uh, that's what you're seeing here because if you look at this val the values that we use in this calculation is is actually been provided here. Assume the following data: a yearly day temperature, a yearly day time temperature at a location ranges from minus ten to plus forty five. A PV model is being installed, which has the following characteristics, right? So at open cycle voltage, it's 43.24. At STC, maximum power point voltage is at 35.35 at STC. Then a temperature coefficient of minus 0 0.168635 volt by degree centigrade, okay? So now, these are the question. What will be the maximum open cycle voltage produced by the model? And this is the calculation here. Um, I wish we have time to go through all of this, but I want to finish this presentation so we don't uh, overtake our time. If you go through this and you don't understand it or you have further question, please contact me and I will, I, will, I will run you through the explanation. But it's a straightforward calculation. Now let's move on. Orientation and inclination. See what angles of PV models. Somebody asked this question. I think we'll get to this. PV models, orientation, and inclination. Inclination is also tilt angle. Tilt, now, these are two different things. Orientation and inclination, they are two different things. Orientation means, is it south facing? Is it north facing? Is it east facing? Is it southeast facing? Is it northwest facing? That is orientation. And tilt angle is that the angle of elevation between the surface and the panel. That is the inclination. That is the tilt angle. Now, these are significant. They significantly affect the amount of irradiation that the surface receives, and hence the amount of energy that the model produces. In the northern hemisphere, the PV model should be, should be facing south. In the southern hemisphere, it should be facing north. This guarantees the maximum irradiation, irradiation level on the PV model throughout the year. In regions close to the equator, the orientation is less important. Um, I don't know if there's a diagram to illustrate this. Now, let me just talk about Nigeria. Now, the optimum tilt angle of the PV module depends strongly on the location. Now, we're talking about tilt angle. The first one, we're talking about the, uh, the, uh, the orientation. If, if the location is in the northern hemisphere, then your solar panel should face the southern hemisphere. If your location is in the southern hemisphere, your solar panel should face the northern hemisphere. Now, let me quickly explain that. When I say southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere, I did not mean, like, for example, northern Nigeria or southern Nigeria. No. The entire Nigeria is in the northern hemisphere. The entire Nigeria, along the equator, that's what we call equator. If you look at the, the global map, that's what we call the equator. The entire Nigeria is in the northern hemisphere. And that's why for every solar panel that you see in Nigeria that has the right orientation, it is facing south. Now, there's what we call azimuth as well. Azimuth, does, as, now, when, when I say that your solar panel should face south, it does not mean that you should just go and face all your solar panel to south, I mean, point and black. Sometimes you also need to look, does it make more sense to put it southwest or southeast? I mean, just tilt it a little bit southwest or southeast, depending on the location. And that's what we call azimuth. However, the solar panel should be facing south, either south, maybe somehow, oriented it toward the southeast or southwest or just south-south. But however, it should be facing south. Now that is the orientation. Now we're talking about tilt angle. The optimum tilt angle of a PV model depend on, depends strongly on the location. As a rule of thumb, the model should be tilted to an angle equal to the latitude of the installation side. Now, most of us have smartphone. When you go to site, just take your smartphone, open your compass. Um, not, yeah, most, Smartphone now has compass. Open it, you can see the direction. You can see north, south, east, and west. You can see that. So you can know exactly where to face your um, your solar panel. And you can also look at the sun. Try to study the sun and see the direction where to face your solar panel. Now, the equator, uh, the, the, the teeth angle should correspond to the equator of the location where you're installing that solar panel. Now, for Nigeria, um, Nigeria, like I said, Nigeria is lo located in the northern hemisphere. So our solar panel should face south. Now, Nigeria is located on the latitude between 4 and 14 degrees. So 
your seat angle. So if you're seeing solar panel installations in Nigeria, it, at least it shouldn't be more than two. The, the seat angle shouldn't be more than twenty, right? If it goes beyond twenty, then maybe because of the roof configuration, but um, anything between ten and fifteen and twenty is fine for Nigeria because our latitude is now. If you're moving from south, and somewhere in the south is about four degrees. If you're moving from south, if you're moving towards the north, it increases to about fourteen degrees. That is our latitude, right? Now, there are countries that are staying on the equator. On the equator means that your latitude is zero. Now, for those kind of countries, you just, you, it makes more sense to drop your solar panel flat on the roof. But however, if you do that, uh, the solar panel will quickly gather dust and debris. And it, there, will not be, there will not be something called self-cleansing. So it now makes sense for you to tilt your solar panel, just raise it a little bit so that it can... It can, it, can, it can be able to do self cleanse So if something falls on it, it can fall off. At least if some level of dust falls on it, it can fall off, okay? So it then makes sense to like tilt your solar panel a little bit. It doesn't make maybe 10 degrees, you can tilt it 10 degrees. Even though it's on the equator, you can still tilt it about 10 degrees and so you can just have that self cleansing So roof mounted, Roof mounted modules are usually simply installed at the same angle as the roof. Since the extra cost of adjusting the tilt angle exceeds the benefit of extra energy that will be generated. I've already explained what this means. Now, in regions close to the equator, this is what I also explained. In regions close to the equator, the most solar irradiance is captured if the solar PV module is flat. However, in practice, a minimum tilt angle of 10 to 15 degrees is recommended to allow for self-cleaning. Now, this is what I mean by, uh, this is uh, this is the hemisphere, okay? Now, this is the northern hemisphere. This is the southern hemisphere. Now, Nigeria is somewhere around here. Nigeria is somewhere just close to the equator. We're not on the, but we're close to the equator. We are somewhere here. And that's why our um, our our latitude is between zero, is between 4 and 14, depending on if you're, if you're moving from the south, it's around 4. If you're moving towards the north, it's around 14. Okay, but Nigeria is somewhere here. We are somewhere close to the equator in the northern hemisphere. And that's why all our solar panels have to face south. This is the direction of the sun. So it has to face south so it can capture, you know, the sun, you know, the most part of the sun during the day. Now, let's just look at um, solar yield estimation. How do you calculate the amount of energy you get out of solar panels? Now, in order to assess the energy yield of a solar PV system, one has to know about the available resources to the PV system, meaning the solar irradiance. Now, this is the solar map of Nigeria. Uh, this is where um, one of our colleagues was saying that if you move towards the north, you find out that the temperature increases, even as much as you have higher sunlight, but of course, the temperature also increases. Then if you move towards the south, uh, you low, have a lower temperature and, and less sunlight. I'll you know, just move on. So the economic feasibility of PV plants critically depend on the electricity yield, which in turn depend on both the meteorological conditions of the location and the performance of the plant itself. As the electricity yield... Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Can you go back to the last uh, slide? Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm saying something. I, what is the maximum sunshine? I mean, peak you can have in Nigeria per day. Um, we 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 are going average. to yeah, we are going to come to that. If you notice, if you see what if you see what I'm pushing here, you see the peaks on our. So we are coming to that. Okay. Yeah, we are coming to that. everything has been captured in. So we are coming to that. It's gradual. I I yeah. So thank you for 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 bringing that up anyway. But we are coming to that. Okay. So as the electrical yield is heavily dependent on the solar irradiance level, it is essential that accurate and long term climate that are available for the given location. Solar irradiation at the site is often stated in terms of the peak sun, which is what you're asking, peak sun hours over a certain period. We are going to, we are going to talk about it with, with work example. So furthermore, com furthermore, component quality, plant design and layout, as well as the maintenance plan will affect the performance and consequently the energy yield of the plant. Let's talk about performance leach. We're going to come, we're going to come back to that peak, peak um, sun hour. We're going to do that. We're going to work. There's an example to, 
to illustrate that. But before that, let us look at what is called performance ratio. Remember when I talked about standard test condition, okay? Solar panels comes at a certain rating, which is called the standard test condition. Now, when you now install this solar panel, the real yield, the real performance of this solar panel compared to that standard test, so the deviation from that standard test condition is what we call performance ratio. The deviation from the standard test condition is the performance. So if the test standard condition is for a standard test condition, for example, 300 watts, and you install that panel, and over time, performance ratio is measured over time. It's not an instantaneous parameter. It's measured over time. And over time, so if that panel is 300 watts, and over time, it's supposed to generate, for example, 100 kilowatt hour. But over that time, instead of generating 100 kilowatt hour, that solar panel generated 70 kilowatt hour. Then the performance ratio of that solar panel is 70%. It's as simple as that. So it's a deviation from the standard test condition. So here is what it is. The performance ratio is one of the most important parameters for assessing the performance of a PV plant. It is the ratio of actual plant output to nominal plant output at standard test condition. So performance, so here is actual output divided by the theoretical output. That is, this theoretical output is the standard test condition. So if you divide 70 by 100, you get uh, 0 0.7, correct? Which is 70% based on the illustration that I just gave. So it is determined by monitoring the actual plant output over a defined period. Like I said, it's something you need to monitor over time. It's not a momentary, a mom, uh, an instantaneous parameter. It's something you need to monitor over a period of time. And dividing this by the nominal plant output in the same period. So the performance ratio will change from period to period depending on environmental and technical condition at the plant. Remember, when you have this installation, sometimes um, conditions changes. Sometimes you may have um, you may have shadings that you might not even notice. It will begin to impact your performance rate. So it's good to keep an eye on your performance rate. That that is important. That when you have installation, you have to do work of continuous monitoring. What how is it performing? So um, I've had an installation done in the past, and over time, um, I got a complaint that this is not working. And obviously, that was during. Uh, the, the dry season, and of course, dust would have settled on the panel. And what we need to do was to go do cleaning, cleaning of the panel, and you know, things started working again. So there needs to be constant follow up to make sure you get the best out of these installations. So a low performance ratio in, is indicative of a high system losses. For example, due to high module temperature, ref reflection of solar irradiation from the module. Soiling on front of the of the glass, shading, component failure, mismatch module output, etc. Therefore, high PR values are desirable. So, in contrast, the performance ratio is also used with common reference values in planning stage for a PV. For example, now if you're planning a PV a, a PV a, a PV um, installation, because you've not installed it, so you don't know what actually the performance rate. But sometimes we use uh, an estimate, okay? So we use an estimate. So uh, it is safe. It is safe to use something like seventy percent performance. It is safe to use seventy performance ratio for Nigeria. If you're doing your design, I mean your initial design, and you want to calculate the energy yield that you could actually get out from this solar PV, you know. So for example, you you've done your load assessment and you find out that your client needs or your customer needs this amount of energy. You know, and you want to be sure that your solar panel can be able to generate that amount of energy. So when you're doing that calculation, it is safe to use something like 70% or 75%. But I think 80% will be optimistic. But 70% is, you know, is, is okay. It's safe to use 70%. So for example, a performance ratio of 70% or 0 0.75 to 0 0.880 is used for grid connected PV system, grid connected PV plant, and 0 0.65 for all grid plants. This means that the expected gross energy production potential will have to be multiplied by the performance ratio value or reduced by one minus performance ratio to reflect the expected production after the system losses. Now, it is better that during your design system, it is better that your, you generate more energy than your client had expected than you generate less energy than your client has expected. 
However, it should the, the deviation should not be so much, right? So it doesn't look like you don't understand or you don't know what you're doing. And that's why I say it is safe to use a performance ratio of 70% or 75%. So once the energy yield of a PV system has been estimated, the revenue from electricity cell can be calculated in order to in order to evaluate the profitability of the project. So if you're doing project uh, project appraisal, you know, you're evaluating projects, especially when it's for an investment purpose, you want to know how, because essentially what you're selling is the energy. The energy that comes out of the system is what you're selling. You're not selling the technology. The technology produces the energy, and you say the energy, you make revenue. So if you do your appraisal, you're doing your financial assessment or your economic assessment, it is the energy output. The energy is the product. That's what you're going to sell and make money. So that's what you're going to use to calculate your return on investment. So it's important that you understand how to estimate the energy yield from solar system. So you can also do the economic appraisal. So let's also look at example of energy yield calculation. So the following equation provides a quick and simple way to estimate the energy yield of a PV plant over a particular period of time. So energy yield, which is E, is equal to peak sun hour and the peak, you know, when you're doing your solar system, you always have this kilowatt peak. So you, I mean, of course, that's the way we classify uh, our, our installation. We'll say maybe 100, 100 kilowatt peak, 30 kilowatt peak. So that kilowatt peak is what this peak is, is, is required. Times your performance ratio, which is what I say you can estimate. You can use zero, you can use 70% is a good place, is a is, is safe to use 70% or 75%. If you feel that uh your PV models, you know, is is going to perform very well, you can use 75. Okay. Now for peak sun hour, I think I will need to explain that a little bit further in the in the in the slide. But peak sun hour is no, you always have confrontations anytime we talk about peak sun hour. Somebody well, so when I said that for Nigeria. It is safe to use a pixel hour between four and five. It is safe to use pixel. So if you're doing a project somewhere around the south, southern Nigeria, you can use four because you know sun. I mean, the, the sun level there is not so intense compared to the north. You can use four or four point five or five at maximum five. If you move towards the, the north, you can use five or five point five and at max six if you're moving towards the south. Now, anytime I talk about this peak sun, sun, sun hour, somebody will challenge me. No, there is some concert in the morning. By 10 o'clock, the sun is out, and the sun stays out until around 5 p.m. So you have enough hours, you know. So it's important that we understand what peak sun hour means. Peak sun hour is, is, is a terminology that has been developed for simplicity of calculation. So it is assumed that the sun is work. Okay, let me not, um, let, that, because there is a diagram to, to help me explain this, but uh, please just keep this by the side and take the formula. I will come back to pick some hour. So where E is energy yield of the PV plant over. So you, what you're actually what you're actually trying to calculate is energy yield of the PV plant. Now pick some hour of the location of the PV plant over the same period of time is in hours per year. Now the peak is the nominal power of the PV of, of the plant, which is the kilowatt peak. The performance ratio. I've also explained this. So this formula is a very simple and a basic formula, and I want to believe that you understand all this terminology. If not for the fact that I will see explain Pixon hour. So the Pixon hour is an imaginary case where the sun shines at a constant irradiance of one thousand watts per meter square for one hour. Remember when I talked about the standard test condition, and I said that the standard test condition is a situation, is a situation whereby you test the performance of the solar model when you expose it to 1,000 watt per meter square at a 25 degree centigrade, correct? Now, peak sun hour is also assuming that the sun, so if the sun comes out in the morning, it shines for 1,000 watts per meter square, you know, for how long does it stay? So in as much as the sun comes out in the morning, it may not, it, it will not be at 1,000 watt per meter square. It could be at maybe, for example, 400 watt, okay? It may remain, okay, let me, for simplicity, if the sun comes out in the morning and it remains at 500 watts per meter square and it shines for eight hours, 500 watts per meter square and it shines for eight hours, please can somebody tell me what is the peak sun hour for that day? Four hours. Four hours. Four hours. Perfect. So, so, so thank you. So you understand what peak sun hour actually means now. So anytime you see the sun, it does not really mean that the sun is at 1,000 watts. Right, 
So Pixel Hour is assuming that you now push all of, all of the 200 watts, all of the 300 watts, all of the uh, 400 watts. You push everything, assume that this is 1,000 watts. For how long can it sustain 1,000 watts per meter square? So if you're somewhere around the southern Nigeria, it is safe to assume 4.5 and at max 5. If you move toward the northern Nigeria, it is safe to assume 5, 5.5 and at max 6 for your design purposes and calculations. So this is just an illustration of what a Pixon um, uh, uh, hour means. So we can visualize Pixon hour by looking at the area below the solar irradiance curve. This area must be similar to the area of a rectangular with the height of 1,000 watt per meter square. The width of the rectangle, rectangle determines the Pixon hour. So this is what happens. During the, time, during the day, in around 8 o'clock, the sun comes out, it starts increasing, the intensity starts increasing, then around 12, p 12 noon, the intensity of the sun is high. At that point, you have the highest, you know, uh, between 12 noon and 1, you have the highest, you know, irradiance of the sun. But notice on that, even at that point, it was not up to 1,000 mega, it's not up to 1,000 watts. It's around 800, you know, yeah, 750, 800. It was not up to 1,000 1, watts. Then it begins to decline up until 5 p.m. and then the sun goes down. Now, let us compress all of this into a rectangle and push it up to 1,000 watts. So if you do that, you might you can see that maybe the Pixon hour will be around four hours. Okay, so that's what Pixon hour actually means. Okay, so this whole so this whole this whole um, sun part is now compressed. So the area under this under this shade is equal to the this um, rectangle, and this is what we call Pixon hour. Please. Is any is anyone lost at this point? Is any does anyone have any question at this point? Okay, thank you. Let's proceed. So here is just a, a, a simple example. So if the irradiance is one kilo now one kilowatt per meter square is also one thousand watt per meter square. Please let's get that straight. So how many sun hour is required to produce four kilowatt hour? Okay, now if you look at our equation. Now we've also we've been given the we have been given the um, the energy yield which is four kilowatt hour. We have been given what again? We have been given the um, the. Now we know what the irradiance is. Okay, um, what again? Performance ratio. We have to assume a performance ratio. Were we given performance ratio? No, I think we have to assume what a performance ratio is here. Okay, so so let's let's uh, now what are we even asked to calculate? How many hours? So we are looking at the hour. How many sun hour is required to produce four kilowatt hours? Now, this question is a little bit tricky. So we are looking for this hour in this peak sun hour. We are looking for uh, the peak sun hour actually. So let's make the peak sun hour subject of the formula. If we move everything here to this side, what will happen? The energy yield divided. So we are we are giving the en um, the energy yield. So the energy yield divided by the peak sun hour, no, divided by the peak system and also the uh, performance ratio. So here we have the, just a moment. Okay, so we have the energy yield, which is um, four kilowatt, now, I want you to understand something that the, there's a little bit of calculation that has already been done here, okay? Now, the irradiance is 4, 000, is one kilowatt per meter square, right? And the energy yield is four, um, uh, four kilowatts. So if you multiply four by one, you have this already, right? You have four kilowatt hour per meter square. So that has been calculated already. Now, if you divide that, if 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 you divide that by one kilowatt hour per meter square, if you cancel this, what you're good, the kilowatt will cancel the kilowatt, the meter square will cancel the, the the meter square. So what you're left with is the hour, correct? So what you have here is four kilo, um, sorry, four hours. I don't know if this is clear. It looks a little bit. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Can I say something here? Go on, please. It seems the performance ratio assumed there is one. Am I correct? 
so in this case, yeah, the performance ratio here. So if you look at what, yeah, it's assuming because assuming that all losses are neglected, it's stated yes. here, right? Yes. So it's that is that. Yeah, okay, go on. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That is the only way you can get this answer. Yeah, exactly. So so that's correct, and yeah, you're, you're very much correct. And it's stated here that in this case, it's assuming that all the losses are neglected. Now you also need to uh, um, take into note that the performance ratio are. The difference between the standard test condition and the performance ratio are the losses. Are, these are the losses that are expected to come from the system, right? So for this calculation, it is assuming that the losses are neglected. So it's just a simple calculation, even though it's a little bit not straightforward, but it's a, it's a simple calculation. So let's, let's look at another example that um, this one is, is actually straightforward. Um, so a PV plant developer is planning two plants, two PV plants one in Northern Europe and another one in Southern USA, and wants to estimate the energy yield of each to gauge their economic feasibility, right? Now, this is the system characteristic. Now, the system in Europe will have a rated power of 1,000 watt peak. Um, the peak sun hour is 1,002. That is the peak sun hour in a year is 1,200. The performance ratio of this PV plant is 0 0.8. Now, if you want to calculate the energy, because remember I said that the energy yield is actually what you're going to sell to make money. So if you want to calculate the energy yield, it now have to be the fiction hour times the, the peak installation and the performance ratio, which is what we are already given. 1,200 hours times 1,000 watt, uh, watt peak times 0 0.8. If you calculate that, you're going to get 980,000 watt hour per annum or 960 kilowatts per annum. Now, this is another pro, this is another pro, this is a second project. The second project is going to be in Southern USA. In this case, you're the same system capacity, 1,000 watts. But in Southern USA, you have a peak sun hour of 1,900, but your performance ratio is 0 0.7. You can see that there, there are differences between this one in Europe and in America based on their peak sun hour and their performance ratio. But their energy yield is what will not tell you where to make that investment. If you do the multiplication for Southern US, you will have 1,330 kilowatt hour per annum. But the same investment, if you do that in Northern Europe, you have 960 kilowatt hour per annum. If you are the one who is going to invest in this money, this, this project, which one would you choose? Southern. Southern US. So, okay, so you're US. Good. Exactly. So remember, they are all the same capacity size of project, and apparently you're going to invest the same amount of money. But because of the weather condition, you will have more energy yield in southern US than doing that project in northern Europe. So when you sell this amount, you're making a lot more money than than the than this than the northern Europe. So this is how you calculate this, is how you use this calculation to do your project appraisals, economic appraisals. Load profile. Um, I, I, I talked about load profile in our last training, but I'm just going to brush on it again in this training because it's important when you do your solar system. Now, um, when you do your solar system, you have to design your solar system to meet the peak demand of the facility. It all depends on the purpose or the objective of solar, solar design anyway, because in, in some cases, you might not need to meet, meet your peak peak load of the facility. There could be other energy source to make the peak load, maybe generator or from the grid. And that's why I see that for some solar system, once the 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 uh, the, the other out, there is outage, especially for off-grid system, you know, there are some load that have been thrown off so that you know you don't need to consume those uh, you don't need to power those loads. But again it is important when you're doing your design for for completeness and for holistic design of a holistic uh, uh, view, because if you're talking to your clients, they also need to know that, oh, if I'm installing this kind of equipment or this capacity of system, you don't need to have this certain load on it so that they also know, because you will have studied your load profile to know, oh, I cannot meet this demand, except you, are, you have you know, a deep pocket to finance it. Otherwise, we can do this. You can implement some load management, and then you're good to go. So for a, for a successful electrification project, it is necessary to conduct a precise analysis of expected electricity demand as it is significant impact, as it has significant impact on the design and cost within the project. So the system should, should be unnecessarily oversized or undersized. System size and leads to high cost, 
oversize the list to high cost, system undersizing could lead to dissatisfaction of electricity consumer due to unreliable electricity supply. Therefore, electricity generation and electricity demand should be in balance. Which is, I, I said something like this in our last class here. I said that the purpose of energy optimization or energy system is to strike a balance between demand and supply. There cannot be perfect balance, but strike, try to make it close. The, the more they are further away from the issue that the more it's the energy is expensive. So uh, this is what a load profile looks like. And of course, this is your peak. At this point is your peak. Okay, so if, for example, you want to recommend a generator for this kind of facility, it's important that you look at this. And it's, first of all, see what you can recommend to you. Now, this is an added consultancy, ad, cons, consultancy uh, um, service that you can give to your client. So, okay, this is what your peak demand looks like. But again, I can advise you to you know, implement some level of load management. So whenever you're running your generator, please don't, don't turn on this load that you know, creates this peak. If you ever want to use this equipment that creates this peak, Please use this any of this time. So instead of instead of recommending a 60 kV, uh, so 60 kV will be about 80, sorry, 60 kilowatts should be about 80 kV generator, right? So instead of recommending 80 kV generator, you can recommend something like okay, a lower capacity generator, right, which will save capex and low fuel consumption. But again, it has to come with load management. You have to find a way to shift your load. So you can, I mean, you can move this your peak load to your, you know, to these valleys. <clears throat> so this is what a peak, this is what this is what a load profile looks like over a month. Uh, there has there, there are projects that if we want to embark on, because we are not sure of their load demand, we have to install meters on this on this side and monitor their energy profile over one month. In fact, sometimes we we'll do that depending on the depending on the size of the project you know um, if it's if it's uh, a city project in fact sometimes we monitor the load profile for for over six months and we extrapolate for the remaining six months because we may not have that patient to wait for a complete year to have a complete year load profile we do some month and we extrapolate the uh, the rest of the month and we use that for our um, assessment so like i said this is what the peak demand it looks like this is what a peak load looks like. Um, so I think with that, uh, we've come to the end of today's presentation. Uh, we slightly um, went overboard by four minutes. I'm sorry about that. Um, we'll try to keep to time, but I don't think we are, we are far off I mean, from the targets today. So um, thank you everyone for your active participation, for your questions, for your comments, and your um, contributions. You? Any, any question? So uh, you say you are going to send all the slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. The slide will be shared. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. okay, hello. Okay. I guess, I hello, guess Engine, we are still open, but adventure, we go to the side and we have some questions we would like to ask. I hope you are still open to us. Yes, yes, sure. Very well. And again, if you are not, if you've not been... Yeah, Engineer Ashima, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Okay, my name is Engineer Biodwa Musa. Yeah, all through this, uh, I'm just hearing from you in our last class. There's no last class there now. I think this quote is uh, starting to decay. <laughs> so please go through everything. Though. These are another set of uh, students here. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I was thinking no. the same thing. Can I address that? Chima, do you want me to address that? Please go on, Ingen Oche. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, this is cohort three. In the past, what we have is energy auditing as a four weeks, as a three weeks private course. And we have a price, about 50,000 naira. We've done it in the last two years. We have renewable energy and solar PV design for three weekends, two, four weekends, two, for four weekends. But what we now did was to say, we now discovered that over time, people who attend this cohort, cohort one, uh, module one, we also want to do module two. So they usually pay 50,000 and 50,000. We said, no, let us combine it together. That's why we have energy auditing and renewable energy, energy auditing and energy efficiency. We have finished that one. We are now starting 
renewable energy and solar PV design, which will last for the next four weeks again. Mm -hmm. So, but then we found out that some people cannot bring out a hundred thousand naira at a go and pay. We now said, okay, when we are starting the second module, we should give a window for people who are only interested in renewable energy to join us. So that's exactly what has happened. Because many people didn't join us from that four weeks ago that we started. This is the fifth week anyway. Because they can't, they can't bring out 400,000. We know how the country is. So we make sure that we give them the opportunity to join us this time around and then continue with the remaining four weeks that is remaining. Then the cost and business investment appraisal, we are going to do it at the end of this course too. So those who are who have attended the first module will still go on with the two modules that are remaining. But those who did not attend the first module, who just joined us this week, many of them just joined us this week, right? They are only attending for these four weeks and they are attending the renewable energy and solar PV design. Thank you. But what we could do to help them we can help share the videos. This is more like bonus. Some of the video mm. for energy auditing because most times you need to have a knowledge of energy auditing for you to be able to size. Please, please, we need we need that video. Thank you. We need that video, <laughs> and uh, please, I also want to confirm that this uh, uh, training is still continuing. The of next course, we've seen it today. Yes, it is. No, we have time. done we have done everything about energy auditing. We're not doing energy. what we are doing now is renewable energy and solar PV design. What we did today was like a foundation. By tomorrow, we're going to the full time calculation, and tomorrow, then by the third next week, Saturday. next Saturday, we're going to calculation. Then on the, the following Saturday, we're going to computer application and Excel application. We understand it's okay, but please help us send the video of the auditing. Then the last Saturday, we'll wrap it up. We'll not wrap it up. So the last time today, we'll not wrap it with costs and business investment appraisal. We have not shared that material. That material is very, very loaded. We've not shared it. And that should be the third module, which is now cut across the two modules. I don't know if there's any question to, to that effect. Did you hear what I asked you? No, sir. I said, please, just as you said, can you help us share the video for the um, energy auditing? We'll do that. That's free. We'll do it in order to you have time to watch them so that you know what those. Thank you. Thank you. Who have joined us in the last four weeks. We'll do that. We'll do that because right. our goal is to, to mainstream uh, energy experts. That's the truth. Our goal, as Chima said in the introduction, uh, a couple of days ago, we got the certif certification. Meanwhile, I don't know if Chima said that at the beginning of this training. This training is not only for you to acquire the skills and chat a new um, a new course in renewable energy and energy design. We're also preparing you that in the future, if you decide to write the certification exam, this will be a very good foundation for you. So it's a two-way thing. One, we want to teach you how to size renewable energy design, how to design a re renewable energy system, but we're also preparing you for the future if per adventure you decide to write um, a certification course. There are two certification course you can comfortably sit for if you finish these two modules. One is Certified Energy Auditor. It's a global certification. The second one is Certified Energy Manager. It's also a global certification that is in very hot demand in places like America and, and, and Canada. But in Nigeria, we are coming on board. All of us know that um, it has not been easy for us to really you know, um, um, coming to the energy efficiency, uh, circular economy, and uh, meet our net zero targets. But gradually we'll get there because the world is moving in that direction. We can't just, I mean, you can't say it's not our business. So we are try doing our best to make sure that we create this awareness, we create this um, kind of uh, escalate this knowledge and make sure that more people and more engineers come into the energy sector. That's our overall goal. But then you need to attach a cost to it because if you don't attach this cost, sometimes people don't take it serious. Believe me, for this training, we have made this training to be free. A couple of people will not take it serious. So I don't know if, uh, if there's any other question regarding that. No, no, that's the truth. So I've been doing training for the past 10 years. I can tell you what, some of this huge amount we attach to this thing is just to give it some level of seriousness. Because when you don't do that, people I mean, people don't place value in what they don't, 
what did not what, what didn't cost That's them anything? true. They don't stay committed. They just think they don't, it's, they don't stay committed. Uh, but when you remember you paid money, just, you, yeah. you, you, you get committed to it. But then beyond it, I just want to emphasize that it's not it's not just the money thing, but it's for us to the more the merrier. Our engineers are lacking in this space. Of course, everyone, all of us know. It's being mm-hmm. taken over by people who are not an engineer, and they are doing not, they are doing a lot of issues. Maybe in the course of our training, we'll discuss these issues. A lot of sizing issues. Lot, and that's why, because the thing is failing, people are lacking confidence. People are mm-hmm. losing. I mean, you, you size things, you do things, you don't do audits. You don't do load assessment. You just say two kilowatts, three kilowatts, five kilowatts. Based on what? Because one electrician somewhere, one, one installer somewhere, just felt that you have a family size of four people, five people. And then you make this recommendation. The same thing is happening in our water sector. You design a water system, you don't size the pipe very well. And then the person upstairs is not seeing water. The person downstairs, only, only when his tap is not running, is when the person, I mean, many issues in our design space. But we said, no, let us find a way and mainstream this thing. Let us find a way. I know it's not easy, but then we're getting it. Here we are about 30 of us. And this is cohort three. So it means in the last, and these are, these are like um, syndicate, syndicated uh, programs. The other programs that we have done that will train more than 100 people. Thank you. Jinachima. Okay, um, I think um, all, I think all has been said. Thank you, everyone, for your active participation again. Sorry, sir. Um, uh, Jinachima, yes, I just sir? want to ask a question, sir. If it's possible, uh, the Adam, audio version, the yeah. audio version before tomorrow you get the you get the recording version okay thank you